I do believe that modern psychology is so pervasive within the age that we live in that it is almost hard to escape the grip of its worldview that surrounds us. That is why I feel led to take my time in combating it. I want to clarify some things from what I spoke about on part one, but in fact, much of what the popular modern preachers that are quote-unquote speaking about relevant things for us are doing is a little more than anointing modern psychology with misplaced Bible verses and principles. It not only permeates many modern pulpits, it is pervasive in the music industry, public schools, and news media. Unless psychology, understanding the mind and behavior, is directed by the Bible and has at its core biblical principles of redemption by the power of God, then it is by its nature antagonistic towards true healing and deliverance. Greetings, Bible believers and followers of the End Time Message. Welcome to another episode of the Jason DeMars Podcast, the place where we explore the incredible mysteries hidden within the pages of the Bible. I'm your host, Jason DeMars. It's time to get started on another journey into the heart of God's Word. If it's your desire to grow in revelation and see the message in the light of the Bible, you're in the right place. Today, brothers and sisters, we delve into the scripture guided by the extraordinary revelations that God chose to unveil through Brother William Marion Branham, a messenger with a unique calling to fulfill Malachi 4 and Revelation 10:7, and unlock the secrets of the end time message. Our purpose isn't to have another basic Bible study. We're going to dig deep and peel back the layers of prophecy, decoding the signs and perhaps discovering how the Bible resonates within the very fabric of our present day and time. In this podcast, my purpose is to help you grow in your faith through solid Bible teaching through the lens of the message of Malachi 4. So grab your Bible, a cup of coffee, and let's get started. And remember that your feedback, testimonies, questions, and prayer requests are always welcome. Please send them on social media or at jasondemars.com. Before we go into today's episode, I want to share something with you. Head over to jasondemars.com where I'm giving away free books. These books have been ordered by believers around the world, and many testimonies have been given about the great blessing they have been. I also want you to know that by God's grace and provision, we are also covering the shipping costs, free books, and free shipping. My purpose is not to sell books, but to proclaim the message of the hour, free of charge. I've written these books to build your faith, increase your spiritual revelation, and be a witness for God's message in the end time. Here's a list of a few of them. A summary of the revelation of the seven seals, the end time message handbook, the mystery of the Malachi for Elijah, holiness to the Lord, and foundations. Head over to jasondemars.com right now and claim your free books. With that said, let's get into today's podcast. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Jason DeMar's podcast. Um, just want to remind everyone that you can go to the website and uh, order books there, jasondemars.com. Um, we have uh, one of them is we're giving away free now. Um, we We actually ran into a situation where there were such an abundance of orders that it became uh, necessary to uh, change the process of uh, what books are free. Um, the the book, the uh, a summary of the revelation of seven seals remains free, but I had to start charging for the rest of them um, because we were getting uh, hundreds of orders every week and it was coming to the place where it was impossible to keep up uh, with that, uh, due to the extreme costs being, uh, would it ha if if I was going to keep up with all of it, it's going to be a cost of like five thousand dollars a month, and uh, I'm a small ministry. I don't have the capabilities to do that, so I apologize for having to change that. But I uh, feel that that was what the Lord was showing us through that situation. Uh, 
So uh, go ahead and get on there and order order your books that you want. We certainly appreciate the support for the ministry from all our supporters. Thank you again. We also have coming out every Friday, uh, we have the End Time Message Handbook going section by section. You can get one section every week, and that is a thank you to our uh, monthly subscribers. Appreciate that. And um, I'm, I guess when this podcast release, I will be on a missions trip in Honduras with Brother Matt Watkins, and uh, we'll be preaching at a few churches and also doing a youth uh, youth camp. So pray for us. I believe when this comes out, it'll be we'll be in the youth camp. So appreciate your prayers and standing with us. And done a little traveling recently and gotten up to uh, earlier in the month, well, earlier in June, got up to Edmonton um, and to British Columbia, got to have some wonderful fellowship with believers up there, just re- thoroughly enjoyed the time, um, got to spend some time with uh, Brother Eugene Brown, and I uh, was so blessed by that, and uh, just a wonderful time of fellowshipping around the Word, and and uh, just gleaning from him, so appreciate that. Well, I wanted to get into, go back into that subject, psychology, a destructive force. I, um, I got some feedback from that, and um, I, I realized that I was mispronouncing uh, one of the founding fathers of psychology, uh, Carl Jung. I was saying it's Carl Jung, so I apologize for that. Also, as I, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, as I dug deeper upon the subject, I realized that Carl Jung himself is uh, some sort of nominal Christian and uh, was a theist, believed in believed in God and and had a theistic viewpoint. Um, nevertheless, um, what his what his philosophy led into is uh, connect, is much connected to uh, modern psychology. Um, you know, I, some some of some of the things he say is likened unto uh, some things that Jordan Peterson says. So there's good value in. Carl Jung, but it, at the same time, it is psychology, and it does have its own limitations. Um, but I want to sort of disconnect uh, Carl Jung from some of the uh, modern psychology that we're, we're we're seeing, and as we dig into that. So in this one, I want to look more deeply at modern psychology, but I also want to really start to go into uh, more of a biblical approach to the mind and to the heart and dealing with healing for that. Uh, uh, Last time was, uh, you know, speaking somewhat about that, um, the power of God through the gospel to bring transformation, but I just want to unpack that more. I feel like the last time was a good start, but not... uh, uh, not complete. So Proverbs 12, 25 says this, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. So the Bible gives us the problem, the cause of the problem, and the solution to it. So a good word brings healing. And so that is not merely um, positive thinking, though you could say that's part of it, but it's the Word of God. He sent His Word 
to heal us. And it's not just merely uh, a supernatural power that comes into our life, but it's a supernatural power that comes and gives us a new way of thinking and looking at the world. All right. So the Bible gives us an outline for mental, emotional, spiritual, and even physical healing to come to us. We want to think about that closely. Number one, the power of the gospel is sent to bring us healing and to transform us to have the mind of Christ. The new covenant, remember, is that he gives us a new nature. We were dead in sin, sins and trespasses, and now he has quickened us. And the Holy Spirit then writes the word of God on our hearts and in our minds. So it's the power of transformation of our, of our understanding, of our revelation. Two, it gives us a ministry of the Holy Ghost through us unto others. So the focus can turn from ourselves to living unselfishly for others to be blessed and healed and loved. Three, it gives us the ongoing remedy to combat anxiety that leads to depression. Four, it gives us a community of people who are interested in loving and healing others. Five, it gives us elders and ministers that can counsel us by the Word of God. Now, biblical counseling is not mere psychology. It's getting to the root of the problem taking the Word of God and bringing it to application directly to individuals in a one-on-one -on -one basis or a husband and wife setting. Now, as I said in the introduction, psychology is so pervasive, it is like the water that a fish is swimming in. It surrounds us, and this worldview is totally permeating everything that we look at and in many ways, it is trying to come into the true bride of Christ to twist her mind into wrong thinking, especially through the younger generations. And that's why I feel t led to take my time to combat it. I preached several messages on this in my home church in uh, Bethel Tabernacle. You can get those at bethel-tab.com and, and find several messages on overcoming depression. But psychology is even permeated into the modern pulpit. Not as much in the message, but especially in the denominational world. But some of it begins to permeate into the message. And unless we understand psychology which means understanding the mind or the study of the mind and behavior. It's put, unless it's put into its context of the Bible, then we will never really see true healing and deliverance. So if we're, if we're treating someone as though they are just a body, you can't bring healing. You have to understand we're a body, mind, body, spirit, and soul. All right. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there is the mind is transformed as it is renewed in the word. So the first thing is we need to we need to surrender. We surrender our body, soul and spirit to God. Right? The way we think, the way we feel, the way we act must be surrendered to God. And then we see we don't we're not we are not to be conformed to the way the world thinks, feels, and acts, 
but we're to be transformed by the word so that our lives prove the good and acceptable perfect will of God. All right. 2 Corinthians 10. Next part is we need to realize we're in the midst of a spiritual battle. This is not mere flesh and a mere flesh and blood affair. It's not a mere changing of the mind. It is a supernatural battle that's going on in the mind that we must make sure that we're not warring after the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought through, through to the obedience of Christ. So every thought must be taken captive, led captive to the obedience of Christ. We need to take every thought captive and make it a slave of the obedience of Christ. So the, the imaginations and the high things, they exalt themselves against the word of Christ. And so we must engage in this battle so that every thought is captive to the word. Now, the Holy Spirit will operate within us using the fivefold ministry within the body of Christ and the spiritual gifts and those endowed with agape love to help us to overcome all of these things. It's the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that operates healing in the human spirit by the work that he does within the soul. In the sermon, The Angel of God, 1948, Brother Branham says, when someone, when sometime, when I can catch their eyes, that's how I get them in that channel, you see. And then it's not a mind reading, it's not psychology. If it is, then Paul used it when he looked upon the man and said, I perceive you have faith to be healed. I will grant you this. It is psychology in this way. Psyche, of course, means mind. And it's the mind of Christ that the human being has the privilege to enter in and know the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. My, what a reality to dwell in the channel of Christ. We unworthy mortals have been brought in to be sons and daughters of God, to be fellow citizens. All right. And in 1961, the sermon Micaiah the prophet, Brother Branham says, we'll never be able to convert the world by trying to shine up our churches and make them bigger and polish up our ministries and better with better education. They already got all that stuff. They got all kinds of psychology and ball games and everything. The world has got that, but we got something that they haven't got. That's Christ, see. Try just to stay in your own territory. We got Christ. They don't have Christ. They got all the psychology. Or don't try to match them with wits with wits. You can't do it. They don't. They can outmatch you. All right. In Just Once More, Lord, 1963, Brother Branham says, Now we got seminaries that hatch out ministers, and we'll, we're building bigger ones all the time, and we got students of psychology. And that's all right if you want to teach psychology, but I don't care about psychology. I want to, I just want to know Jesus Christ. That's all. Now, before I go more in depth on this, I want to say, we as believers must take our time and really understand that people do need counseling and people do need time spent with them to counsel them to get to the root of the problem and to help them overcome but much of it is as we've sp spoken about before it it's a wrong way of thinking it's a wrong way of approaching situations and this leads to the need for counseling people that go into anxiety, then depression, then to suicidal thoughts. This is a process that happens due to wrong ways of thinking and wrong ways of approaching. And so with, with love, you approach the situation with them. 
and then ap applying the word of God to the situation. Now, all right, so let's look at this. Let's start to go into this. Psychology seeks to explain and categorize human behavior. As such, it's directly affected by the worldview that stands behind that theory. Now, the worldview of today that's prevailing is feminist. And the extreme uh, female characteristics of uh, fairness and uh, paying attention to uh, feelings and emotions is is what is right now being promoted and to its extreme it's anti-christ and anti-word mentality in modern psychology everything is based upon our level of happiness and this happened to you as a child and now you have a trauma response and this thinking has been popularized and i know even even as such there are many psychologists who realize this is the wrong approach and it isn't correct. There's an aspect of truth that, that our past hurts and trials and tribulations uh, can harm us and limit, limit us, but this has muddied the waters to the point that it's put people into a satanic jail. Um, what is of particular note is that the prevailing theory going around among many generations of people, Gen X, Millennials, Gen Z, is that our basic behavior came as a result of trauma responses from childhood. We speak in terms of being triggered by certain things we encounter, and this creates a behavior chain resulting from past experiences. So, uh, again, this is true on some level, but the problem with this version of psychology is that it leads to a permanent victim mentality. God never allows us to blame our behavior and our responses on others. We are responsible in His sight for our choices and our behavior. While trauma response can be helpful in understanding root causes of some behaviors, it doesn't explain everything, and in some ways, the extreme approach of therapeutic psychology is not really of any use in bringing healing at all. Now, I'm sure there's social workers that help people change their minds, and that's good. I never want to take anything away from anyone that does good in the world, but I'm afraid Satan has gotten a hold of a system of this world and has caused almost irreparable damage to a generation of people that has produced the most depressed age in all of history. One of the most crippling parts is that we spend so much time focused on seeking happiness for ourselves, that we lose track of what the real meaning of life is. This person hurt me. This person did me wrong. I'm this way because of that thing mom did when I was young or dad said when I was a teenager. The fact is seeking happiness as an end in itself is in fact a way to wind up in meaninglessness. Thinking about our problems does not solve the problems. Thinking about our thoughts and ruminating about our past does not bring healing. We may need to talk about it. We may not need to talk about it. Everyone's different. Everyone deals with grief and problems differently. Sometimes talking too, too much about it leaves us fixated on it. Sometimes it's better to slowly move on, commit it to God. Sometimes you need to speak about it with your pastor or a minister or friends and a spouse that loves you. But if you're trying to find happiness for its own sake, it will always elude you. Now, this approach is an entire atmosphere created in the Western world that has made us all psychologists trained up by the pervading viewpoints of the world. What if psychology, which is supposed to heal, actually ends up doing more harm than it does good. What if modern psychology is pointing people to the wrong things? What if the cause for the increase in depression over the last 60 years is, in fact, that psychology 
and this new so-called therapeutic approach to parenting that has taken over has in fact done the opposite of what has been intended. Brother Branham says, in 1964, the identified masterpiece of God, what we need today is the life of Christ inside of us. That's what purifies. Not the outward, a turned around collar or a degree of psychology or something. It takes the power of the resurrected Christ to make us what we should be. God has no other plan than to let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in the church. Now Satan has deceived the elites of education, entertainment, and government into turning people's focus inward. I feel this way. Focus on how you feel. Think about how you feel. Talk about how you feel. Don't judge how you feel. Understand why you feel that way. And keep coming back to the social worker, the therapist, etc. We'll treat you and we'll give you meds we think you need to fix you. Now, I, I know people struggle and I know people face difficulties and sorrow and sadness comes, but it's how we approach this that will dictate if we can heal or if we become victims. Now, this so-called therapeutic approach has turned the world of young people into perpetual victims of how others treat them and how they feel about it. The, this is a focus on self instead of a focus on Christ and serving others. Now, again, I believe people have real demonic oppression, addictions to lust, pornography, anxiety, depression. It is real and it's difficult. And it is the body of Christ that needs to raise up to bring healing. But there's a bib biblical approach to anxiety and depression. And until we find that approach, we'll be searching for answers in all the wrong places. All right, now I want to I want to read Philippians 4, 6 through 9, and I want to read it from the NLT. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Now, anxiety... Uh, now, depression, let's say it this way. Depression comes from anxiety, right? And anxiety is connected to worry. So, And worry is a way of thinking about situations and possible situations and things that happened in the past. That's a way of thinking about it. You, it's, it's a fearful way of approaching approaching these situations and now when you come to this you realize there's two ways to think about the situation now paul tells us do not don't worry about anything this is a command from scripture this is talking about having peace in the mind and in the soul and so it's important to understand you can think with unbelief, which is worry, or you can think with faith, which does what? It commits it to prayer. It's the same process in the mind. Worry engages the imagination and unbelief about circumstances. Faith takes it to prayer and goes to God about the circumstances. And, and Paul says, tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. So a part of this process of making our situations known through prayer to God is thanking him for what he has done, thanking him for the answer through his promises in the word about your situations. When we engage this, uh, this faith through prayer and thanksgiving, what what then, the Bible says in verse 7, then you will experience God's peace. As you see that, then you will experience God's peace. So when you do this instead of worry, you will experience God's peace. But if you follow the path of worry, right, this is the wrong direction. Then you will experience peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. 
His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Part of this guarding is how we approach thinking about these things. If we engage in worry, it will produce anxiety, which will produce depression. But if we pray about everything, tell God what we need and thank him for what he has done, God's peace will surround us. You can't, Again, we see this many times. People come to the prayer line, especially at youth camps. I'm, I, I, uh, ha- over half of the prayers, it seems, are I'm facing anxiety. I have anxiety. And you can come to the prayer line and the minister can pray and you can be delivered. But if you're not, haven't changed the way that you think, then you will be right back in the same situation. When it, when it comes to approaching worry and anxiety and fear, the Bible gives us a remedy. We certainly pray and commit it to God, but it's how we think on a daily basis, not merely going to the prayer line and getting it cast off of you, then going out and getting it back on you again because of the, you're not thinking right. This is how we have to think. Look at what he says in verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. See? Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So the God of peace is not with you just because you pray about it. There's, there's a process. Prayer is a part of it, but that's not all of it. You have to pray. So when the worry comes, instead of worrying, you have to pray. You have to tell God what you need. Thank Him for what He's done. Then peace will come. But not just it's not just avoiding the worry and the fear. It's fixing your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. See, it's about fixing your thoughts, changing your thought life, so that instead of thinking about all the bad things that could happen and the fearful things that could happen, you're thinking about the Word of God. You're thinking about the, the, the blessings God has given you, the positive things that have come to your life, the change that happens by the Word of God based on His promises. Then the other part of it is, Paul says, put into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Right? So in other words, in doing, in obedience to the Word, there is deliverance. Right? then the God of peace will be with you. We want peace, but we want to bypass the process that leads us to peace. And it starts with faith in God's promises, praying over, praying over God's promises, applying the word to your life, walking in obedience to the word. When you do that, that is where peace comes from, lasting peace. This is not just a peace that comes from being in church service. This is not just a peace that comes from the preacher praying for you. All right. Now, multiple situations that we can refer to where men of God uh, started down the wrong way of thinking and, and led them to led them to depression and a desire for death. God comes to Job in that situation and says, "Who is this that darkens?" counsel by words without knowledge. In other words, God tells Job, you're thinking wrongly about the situation. If you didn't think wrongly, it wouldn't lead you to this desire for death. Moses thought wrongly about the situation he was in. Instead of praying and asking God what to do, he got angry and said, you put this burden on me alone. God did not put the burden on him alone. Moses was merely a voice And God was there all along doing the miraculous, leading, providing, and protecting. 
Moses merely needed to trust God through the situation. Instead, he put it upon himself and ended up depressed and wanting death. Elijah, instead of standing by faith and asking God to defend him, ran away like a coward. He ended up out in the wilderness alone, asking God to kill him, walking by fear instead of faith. Jonah had the wrong thinking about God's heart for Gentiles, and it led him to to hatred for them and not wanting them to be delivered. And God worked contrary to his desire, and it led him to anger and despair. All of these circumstances led to a response that wasn't rooted in faith, but was rooted in fear. Their thinking about the situation was wrong, and it led them down a path of anxiety, depression, and dark thoughts. I want to keep these examples before you. Now the world tries to give a remedy, and God gives us the remedy in the Bible. God's armor is all supernatural and operated by faith. Faith comes from the gene of God in the human soul. But that faith has to operate through its channels. Five channels of the spirit, memory, conscience, reason, imagination, and affections. If any of these channels are clogged, they will hinder faith from operating in our lives. Now the world tries to give a remedy dealing only with these channels from the outside. But God has a supernatural ability to operate by the Holy Spirit in the soul to change our nature by sanctification. That cleanses us from evil and sin. Again, the Bible lays upon us responsibility. Ezekiel 18, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What mean ye that you use use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Right? Everyone will give an account of himself to God. Romans 14.12 says that. For our own sins, we are all held accountable for our own actions, reactions, responses, attitudes, and everything we do. We might be, we might be a person that has come up in the inner city. We don't have a father in our life. Our mother was a drug addict. We were the product of uh, rape. We were the product of whatever it might be that comes upon your life. You say, I start out in the hole. You do, but it's how you respond to it that leads to it. You do not need to remain a victim. God provides everything in his word to bring you healing. And there's hundreds of stories, thousands of stories of people that were born in, into horrible homes and horrible situations. Now, God understands and sees that, but he also offers healing, and it depends on how you respond to it. God has placed things in, you say they didn't have a chance. Everyone has a chance and a choice. It depends on if you want to continue in the normal way that's around you, or if you want to respond to the healing and grace that is offered to you. Everyone is responsible for his own choices. You're not going to be asked, asked at the judgment bar, who made you do that? Was that a result of your father? Was that a result of your mother? I know, understand, behaviors can be explained upon some outward response due to something that's happened in the past. But the fact remains that God will hold you and me personally accountable if we disobey the word regardless of what the cause of it. So to hold someone else accountable makes you merely a victim of circumstances and holds you captive to a behavior that limits you and your status. God never seeks to limit us based upon what has happened to us. Instead, he provides a way of escape and deliverance. 1 Corinthians 10, 
12 and 13 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. God gives an opportunity for everyone to receive mercy. People go into judgment because they step over mercy. They step over the way of escape. For first, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God that raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So God provides deliverance and a remedy for pain, trauma, sorrow, and ways of thinking that are contrary to his word. And he also brings us through this, these things so that we ourselves can be a comfort to others. The Bible says that Jesus was anointed to preach the good news to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to appoint them to them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All right. The Bible also says that he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So Jesus took upon himself our suffering and sorrow so that we could receive deliverance. The gospel provides deliverance for it, and it provides the means of deliverance the, through the power of the Holy Ghost and the principles of the Word of God to apply to our personal life. Now, sometimes sorrow is good. 2 Corinthians 7, 9-10 through 10. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorrow after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. And verse uh, 11, For behold the selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did, not, did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, not for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Now, it's not through psychotherapy and psychotropic drugs that we receive deliverance these are poor replacements for the power of the gospel and the deliverance that comes to us through the supernatural spirit of god moving in our midst if we follow god's word and use what he has provided us with in this world we don't need a poor replacement based upon atheism evolution feminism to try to heal us and help us with our problems though on the short term some drugs may help. In the long run, healing must come from God. And those places we have thinking that is contrary to the word needs to be transformed so that we think with the mind of Christ. It isn't a mere mental work that will change us, but it is the supernatural power of God that will truly bring transformation on the soul level. Now, people that have been sexually abused they need love and healing and proper direction from the word. People that have been mistreated and spoken against, they need healing. 
They need to be be told they they don't need to be limited by their past, and they're thinking about situations from the past. The Bible holds you responsible for your actions and holds others responsible for theirs. The Bible also directs us to deal with our problems correctly. Many times we want to go to the pastor or to a therapist or a social worker or a psychologist and tell our problems to them. But the Bible says if someone has sinned against you, go to them directly and tell them. And try to reconcile there. And if they will not, then bring another person with you. And then if they don't, tell it to the church. Ultimately, God will always bring justice where there is injustice and mistreatment. But he calls us to be patient and to wait for him. Psychology tries to take the place of what God has put in place in his word. Now, I, I'll, put, I'll put it again. Biblical counseling, applying the word to situations, is key and important. And, and I think in some ways we have neglected that in pastoring. It must be a part of pastoring. Listening, understanding, and placing the word correctly for broken and hurting people. We as a body of believers must be more aware and available to help people through hard times using the right biblical principles of love and friendship, listening more than talking and being led by the Holy Spirit to see the people that need healing in their minds and hearts. In every instance, I want you to understand every time the man of God walked down the wrong road in their minds, it led them to depression and asking God for death. And it was amazing because it was met by God himself and they were given some form of comfort that led to correction. God knows that we need, that we deal with these things. Now, these men of God didn't have the National Institute of Mental Health. They didn't have universities that trained up social workers and psychologists to direct people's minds to think deeply about how they feel which then led to a further excessive obsession with mental health. They lived in a time when no one even thought much about that. They still got depressed, and God gave them comfort. Now we come to the place where under the New Testament, we have the Holy Ghost dwelling within us, makes us pilgrims and strangers in this world. We face many trials, many difficulties. An additional difficulty that we do not need is to try to approach the world and our minds the way the modern world is teaching a broken generation to deal with their thought life we have to approach our thought life like we are in a war and that satan is seeking to control us using our thought life do not worry the bible says do not worry but instead pray and thank god for the answers Control your thought life and think on the things that are good, pure, virtuous, praiseworthy, and then the things the Bible teaches and exam- the examples it gives do, and the God of peace will be with you. It's not in ruminating on past hurts, re-victimizing ourselves and our thought lives, claiming our mental battle as named illnesses that we find healing. The Bible gives us plain talk. We can be delivered, but unless we learn how to live the word, we will be right back at it so again the steps to healing and overcoming power don't engage your mind in worry instead pray worship and give thanks to god for the answer in faith control your thought lives by the word of god do walk in obedience put into practice the things in the word then the god of peace will be with you You can never do this without the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. So the prerequisite is to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then it's in faith, controlling the thought pattern and doing the word. Now I want you to think about this for healing. What are the steps of doing the word? Number one, talk to your pastor and someone that you trust in the body of Christ. Talking through the depression can often lead you to discover the wrong ways of thinking, unrepented sin. Or just help release the pain that you have by talking to someone that cares. 
then act in obedience to the word, to God's word. Wake up in the morning. Spend time in prayer and reading the Bible before you go to sleep. Do the same. Listen to sermons of Brother Branham. Attend every church service and Bible study and prayer meeting the church offers. Talk to and fellowship with like-minded believers. Don't run away and isolate yourself. Resolve conflicts quickly as best as you can. Deal with people that wrong you directly, not in gossip or behind their back playing the blame game. Go directly to your brother or sister and speak to them and get it resolved. Start doing something to serve others. Take the focus off of yourself and put it on others. Exercise your body. Drink water. Eat healthy. Talk to yourself and your thought life using scriptural patterns of thought, not demonic lies from the past and the ways of the world that teaches you to nurture your thoughts and feelings. All right, so now let's, let's continue talking about the problem that we're facing in this age. We're living in an age that is plagued with depression. People are constantly facing demons that take their minds to dark places. People become plagued with anxiety, and then that turns to depression, and that, then that turns to dark thoughts of self-harm and even to harming others. Brother Branham says in 1961, The Uncertain Sound, Traveling around from nation to nation, I find that everyone seems to be nervous, and the psych wards are filling up, and the people are down the street. There seems to be so much anxiety and rush just as hard as they can till they don't have courtesy even one for the other. And I've noticed it amongst all people. Now, 1950s and 1960s, it was considered very rare for anyone to be suffering from depression. Under 1% of people now. In America, 15% of young people aged 12 to 17 and 8% of adults from, suffer from major depress, depressive, de, depressive disorder. Sorry. Now they tell us one in five Americans suffer from a mental illness. 70% suffer from so, some form of anxiety. This is absolutely demonic forces. It's a spiritual war. But I want you to see that the un enemy has created a world system that creates uncertainty and anxiety. Now, if you think about the world that we live in, the government is very clearly hiding things and deceiving the public. Social media leads to the fear of missing out and anxiety over not having the perfect life that so-and-so has. Young people use their phones to bully one another. Older people use their phones to troll and mock one another. Then you have the atmosphere of hyper-awareness and self-diagnosis of mental health issues and the fixation on happiness as an end and of itself. Everyone gives themselves a diagnosis, identifies themselves with this diagnosis based on some social media thing or reel they watched or article they read or social worker they talked to. Then they go to therapy and the therapist often encourages them to ruminate and think about how they feel. At the public school and in the hospital, the social workers will ask questions that lead down a deceitful road that we are trying to find the ever-elusive happiness that we are supposed to live in at all times. Even on Apple Health and various other popular apps, you see many of these questions. Now, these questions are issued by the National Institute of Mental Health and it's used to be asked of young people by the doctor, apart from their parents, when they're concerned the child might have mental health issues. These are the questions they ask. In the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off if you were dead? In the past week, have you been having thoughts about killing yourself? Have you ever tried to kill yourself? If yes, how, when? Are you having thoughts of, of killing yourself right now? If yes, please describe. This is how they'll operate. They'll separate the child from the parents and ask the questions. A child having any dark, dark thoughts would certainly have very dark, dark seeds planted in their mind by this way of thinking. 
we are encouraged then to think about how we feel and to examine our feelings about everything as though they are the truth and they are the final authority on everything. And now there is a so-called therapeutic approach to parenting that's taken hold from the 90s to today. Raising children is to be based upon how they feel and things like spanking and making decisions on their behalf are now considered abusive. The core absolute of parenting has become our child's happiness at any given moment. The book of Ecclesiastes shows us that already that seeking happiness for its own sake is vanity of vanities, meaninglessness of meaninglessness. Instead of seeking to raise children the way they should go, of course we know must be connected to their heart and know how they're feeling and care about that. But we aren't to be governed by their feelings. We're to help them understand their feelings and to overcome them and how to feel the right way. If they feel they want to go and use drugs and have sex to be happy, look at porn to be happy, we know this is the wrong direction. We, we correct them. If they want to disrespect their mothers, their mother or their father, this matters very little. If they want to disobey, there's consequences regardless of tears and sorrow. Now parents, they do everything they can to deliver them, their children from all consequences and they do everything for them and let, let them dictate everything in the home. Think about this. The first generation of children raised so incredibly gently and now they hate their parents because of childhood trauma they experienced. And now it's the first generation that doesn't even want to have ch children of their own. How is it possible that children raised so gently and with all kinds of psychotherapy have become a generation of young adults full of despair and one of the most unhappiest and depressed generations ever? Young adults are not a pre prepared for jobs, to live on their own, or even to have a remote amount of responsibility. They need safe spaces and time off to care for their mental health. They've been taught, and it's been emphasized, that they continually consider their mental health and to allow their feelings to dictate the terms of everything. In other words, they have been taught to be led by their human spirit, which is governed by the desires of the flesh. And in fact, given an overarching approach to life through the eyes of victimhood and a lack of personal responsibility. They've been taught to seek happiness as an end and of itself, and it is vanity. It's meaningless. Solomon went through this whole process and found that seeking wisdom, becoming a great scholar of every subject is vanity. Seeking after happiness by not denying yourself any sensual pleasure is vanity. Seeking happiness by finding the perfect command companion is vanity. Seeking after happiness by giving yourself wholly over to work is also vanity. What does he say? The end of the matter. All having been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. This is the whole duty of man. This is the whole man. That's what that word means. This is the purpose and function of man. When he, the man gets the Holy Ghost and reverences God and lives the Word by the Holy Ghost, this is the whole man. Now man has found his purpose and function in life. Then he can walk in joy. And I want to read a quote that I think is really, uh, really wonderful. This is, from the sermon life in 1957 and this gives a wonderful picture if if we're rejoicing over the world and the evil things our minds and our souls are inspired by below boogie woogie dances heartaches drinking all these other things that we run after it's from below but if we rejoice in the spirit that we have eternal life and we raise our emotions to god and praise him then we have joy then we have joy. Jesus said that your joys might be full, but not full of the perverted life, 
but full of eternal life above. So you can see it depends on what you look at. Now, just for instance, for the psychology part of it, psychiatric, now let's notice just a moment the psychic view. Here is the picture of Christ, and here is an electric fan. It depends on which one I look at. See, if my emotions is moved this way or my emotions is moved that way. If I look at that and long for that and desire that, my emotions is set towards the fan. But if I look this way, my emotions and my desire is set that way. That's the reason Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. See, it's where your emotions is set, where your thoughts is. And then we can rejoice on because that we are the children of the promise on the great eternal church of God who has Christ's own promise. It can't fail. That's right. The world thinks that we're crazy. Oh, this is life. Whoopee. I am this day to see a young lady who went uh, and a psychiatrist. She's 35 years old, never smoked, never drank at all her life. A very fine girl. Her people are Christians. Her father is a doctor. And she gave her life to Christ in early stage. And what did she do? She goes out. And she finally goes, finally gets to a place, to a college where she was teaching or being taught. And a psychiatrist there, he sit down to talk to her and he said, you mean that you've never kissed a boy? She said, not one time in all my life. You mean you've never had a little drink and been in a party? Never. He said, girl, you don't know what you're missing. Now him being a psychiatrist, he swung the girl's mind until now she has become so evil and so bad till she don't even want to hear the name of Jesus spoke to in her presence and even her father and mother can't even see her no more and she has lost her mind and this next week we'll go to the institution for shock treatment it's because that she turned her thoughts from christ unto what that psychiatrist was a moving in her mind and that's what we are here for this morning to move your mind and your thinking from the things of the world until the things of god which is eternally and that's what preaching is for is to pervert the, the thinking to a higher and better and to the place where Christ is until you become converted. Then your mind reaches for those things which are above. Now, but in this other place, gets to the girl, they're thinking she might make take poison at any time. Sure, life becomes so miserable, that type of life, until they kill themselves, take poison and everything. Now, but God in his great economy for mankind has made man in the way that he wanted man to be. Now he made man to thirst. Did you notice David here said, My soul thirsteth for thee. Oh, I love that. As in a dry lands where there's no water. Just imagine, said, My soul is so thirsty, God, I'm thirsting for you. Just like I was in a land where there was no water. He must find water or perish. My soul is thirsting for thee. Now God made a man with thirst. That's a part of the human being is his thirst. But God made the man made the thirst in man to thirst for God. And the devil has perverted it and make it a thirst for his kingdom, for the world. Do you get it? The thirst in man is godly, for God made man to thirst, thirst for God. And how dare some of you who would be so little as to try to quench that blessed blessing thing of thirst be trying to satisfy that with drinking and smoking and television and running and carrying on and reveling around, trying to satisfy that godly thing that God put in you to thirst for him. You are perverting the fountain that God has placed in you to receive his spirit. And you're drowning it with the things of the world. And they do not satisfy. They never will. And that's the reason you put a pistol to your brains to blow them out is because that you go the, that things go the way they do. And the world is on the great suicide and a perversion and a homosexual. And the crime is in the land the way it is is because you're perverting the very same thing that God give you and trying to satisfy it with the evil of the world. Take that blessed Holy Spirit that God placed the thirst in your soul to call for and you satisfy it with a nightclub somewhere. No wonder you got a headache the next morning. Then you'll take a case of beer and go to your house and sit down and drink it, trying to satisfy that godly thirst that God put in your soul to thirst after him. And take the devil's slop and try to satisfy the thirst that God put in you to thirst after him. How can you receive anything but eternal separation from the presence of Almighty God when he made you to thirst after him? And David surrendered himself and said, My soul is thirsting like I was in a dry land where there's no water. I thirst for thee, O God. There you are. David said, I seen thee in thy sanctuary and my soul thirsts for that power. There you are. That's the difference. That, that That's what makes things different is the thirst that God give you is satisfy you with the water, the living water. Now let's bring this to, get back together with the direction we're looking at in modern psychology. Is it possible that Satan has inserted something into this generation 
to pollute it so terribly that it cannot stand even another generation. This is the world's atmosphere that young people are raised in, and then their entertainment plunges them into the pop psychology world that blames everything on the parents. And this breaks relationships and ruins homes and leads them into further despair. This is the world our kids are surrounded with. Satan's gospel of psychology brought into the classroom and into the home and into social media has forced a generation of people into focusing on our mental health to the point that we are crippled by it. The crippling part is that we spend so much time focused on seeking happiness for ourselves that we lose track of what the real meaning of life is. This person hurt me. This person did me wrong. I'm this way because of that thing mom did when I was young or dad said when I was a teenager. Seeking happiness as an end in of, of itself will wind up in meaninglessness. As we look at this situation in the public schools, young people are, are brought into a, even a math class. And in the math class, the teacher has them s sit in a circle and they go around and uh, has anyone been having sad thoughts lately? And so then they begin to tell and then one of the kids starts to tell about a situation in his family and he's exposed himself to everyone in, in the class uh, uh, about a situation in his family and then every, it results in crying and then the, then the kids, then the teacher really encourages that and is happy that a kid has opened up about their feelings and a situation in the home and the other kids in order to get approval as well. They'll start talking about this and, and they say, unless we do address their feelings, they can never learn math. Well, the reality is who can learn math when they're focused on all their problems? The, the positive thing would be to forget about your problems and focus on math. Instead, they they, they're, they're encouraged. This, is a, this is not just math class. This is every class. This therapeutic approach, then, they record it. They pass it on to the social working uh, department. And this is in their records. And they have access to this. And so now the kids will enter into a social worker program and they're taught to ruminate and think about their problems, and it brings them into further psychological damage and issues that they face in their life. And this whole approach is, is so limiting and so destructive that what it has produced is young people that can't function without their parents running their lives they have to have their parents call in sick to work they have to call have their parents deal with their teachers and they don't know how to take personal responsibility for their own actions R responsibility is what leads to meaning in life taking responsibility that God has given to you will lead you down the road of happiness. Without responsibility, there can be no happiness. And when the devil has created such a system that has removed responsibility from people, placed it onto others, it has created a generation of people that are so depressed. We have, in order to walk on a life of joy we have to learn how to directly face our fears directly face our problems and to overcome them brother branham says in the sermon adoption number three in 1960 yesterday people don't know what depressing time comes with this type of ministry i got real depressed and i said to the wife i wish i could just go on she said why you say that bill I said, oh, here I have troubles and things. And then it seemed like the Holy Spirit said, are you trying to bypass them? Are you trying to dodge them? See? No, I said, I just, just let me stand right up in the face of all of it and face it out. See? Amen. Now we just saw 
what leads to healing, what leads to strength. Don't try to run away from your problems. Don't try to put the, shovel them onto someone else. Don't dodge them. Don't run from them. Stand up in the face of all of it. Face it out, is what the prophet said. Face your problems head on. Don't run away from them. Don't stuff them. Don't blame them on someone else. Face them. Deal with them. That is where you will take responsibility for your own thoughts, your own actions, your own self. Face them and walk forward. This is the place where there's healing, where there's strength. You say, well, uh, uh, I have church trauma. I have this trauma. We're going to have to face them. I don't know what to tell you. Beyond all, th all these things, we will have to face them. And that's it. That settles it. We, we see in our modern world, there is such a hyper focus on our feelings and how we feel about things. And we've got to be able to overcome the way the world is teaching us and training us how to think. Um, there's a really good book. I forget the lady's name. It's called uh, Bad Therapy, Why children are not growing up and in this book she details the whole system of psychology that is there and therapeutic parenting that's surrounding this and how destructive it's being on our society and as christians we have to learn to think of our problems not the way the world assigns it but we need to think about it the way the word of god assigns it now no doubt there's a need for counseling there's no doubt there's a need to find the source of the problem and why the things are happening but the reality is regardless of what the source is perhaps it's the way you were brought up perhaps it's the you have to face your problems you have to take personal responsibility for the situations in your life and you have to face them and deal with them sometimes it's boundaries that you're not putting it up in your life you're letting you're letting your your parents as an adult, maybe you're letting your parents or your extended family dictate how you live your life and how you act and have let them hold a, a wrong place in your home. Or perhaps parents yourself are trying to deliver your children from every problem that they have. And this is only causing more problems for you. Children need to learn that there's consequences for their actions. Help them to learn that. Help them to learn to take responsibility for what they've done and to receive the consequences for that responsibility. You yourself understand you have to own your own mistakes and problems and face the consequences head on. Don't try to run from them or bypass them. If there's fearful things in your life, use that as an indicator, not to run away from it, but to face the fear and deal with the issue and problem. Otherwise, you're going to keep coming back to that same fear. All right. <laughs> Love you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, again, any questions, prayer requests, or testimonies, please let me know at jasondebars.com. Um, if you need any, uh, if you have any subjects you'd like me to cover, let me know. I'd like to take that into consideration and study those and present on those as well. So God bless you. Thank you so much.